This is Twisted, where we pontificate and philosophize while attempting to unravel the intricacies of true crime. Many of our discussions relate to criminal acts and objectionable behavior. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to episode 26 of Twisted. I'm your host, John Taylor. You can listen to episodes through twistedpodcast.com, iTunes, Stitcher, or Libsyn. I'm putting out two episodes per month with the first one on the first of the month and the second one around the 15th. To get updates on new episodes and other true crime info, please follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Tiarta24, which is an acronym for the inmates are running the asylum, followed by the number 24. Today is part one of a two-part interview I conducted with Lynn Blanchard. Lynn has a background in chemistry and now writes and advocates for the wrongfully convicted. She works with the Deskovic Foundation for Justice, which seeks to exonerate innocent defendants. She has written articles on the Teresa Hallback murder, a.k.a. Making a Murderer, and her first book was Framed, an Examination of the Nancy Cooper Murder Case. Today we are talking about her second book, Absence of Evidence, an Examination of the Michelle Young Murder Case. It was published on September 2nd, 2016, and is available through Amazon.com. You can find it by entering the search terms, Absence of Evidence. Here's a short synopsis of the book. Michelle Young was living the American dream. She was a former North Carolina state cheerleader living in Raleigh, North Carolina, with her husband Jason, their beautiful two-year-old daughter Cassidy, and they had a boy on the way. However, on November 3rd, 2006, Michelle was found beaten to death in her home. Police immediately suspected Jason, but he was out of town at the time of the murder. Now, on to the interview. Hey, John. Hey, Lynn. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? Good. Walk me through the Michelle Young murder case, uh, like kind of the high level. Okay, so basically what happened, um, this happened in November of 2006. Michelle and Jason Young were married three, let's see, about three years, I believe, um, they had a two-year-old daughter. They were pretty young. I think she was 29. He was 32. They lived in, you know, a pretty nice house in a Raleigh suburb. And Jason was out of town on business, um, visiting customers. Early afternoon, November 3rd, he called Meredith, who is Michelle's sister, and said, hey, I remember that I printed some um, eBay papers on a purse that I want to get for a surprise gift for Michelle. Can you run to the house and, you know, grab them? Now, Meredith had um, nannied for them, so she was unusual for her to go to the house on occasion, even when they weren't home, to print things or whatever she was doing. So anyhow, he told her to go to the house and get that. She went there and found her sister dead, face down in the master bedroom, in a pool of blood. So she called 911, and before even checking on Michelle's condition, even checking for a pulse, police ended up coming out there and it ended up being a tunnel vision case. They instantly assumed Jason was involved naturally because he's the husband, which of course you're going to look at the husband, but they ended up, you know, never investigating other options. And basically, even though he was 170 miles away in a hotel when this would have happened. So they lived in the, the suburbs of, of Raleigh, North Carolina in a, in a, yeah. Fairly affluent neighborhood. I mean, it's a very nice house they lived in. Yeah, it's a quiet neighborhood, nice brick house that sat back from the road. Right, not a neighborhood you would expect there to be much crime, and, and certainly not felonies or violent crimes such as murder. Exactly. And Jason worked, I think he worked like in healthcare IT. He was a salesperson, and he had left for uh, a, a business trip that, that night prior. And yeah. so he was, like, like you said, he was a couple hundred miles away from the house at the time that, likely at the time that the uh, murder took place. Yeah, it was probably about a four-hour drive. It was in um, Hillsville, Virginia, the Hampton Inn, which it's, it's kind of a tedious drive because you had to go, I mean, for people not familiar, but driving from Raleigh through Greensboro and then kind of in through a hilly, mountainy area to get up there. And it was kind of a halfway, kind of two-thirds of the way to hit where a sales call was going to be the next day. They were having, and I think I think that most people find it relevant, whether it's it's not evidence, but they were having marital problems at the time that her murder took yeah. place. Yes, they were arguing a lot about um, her mother was um, 
Michelle wanted her mom around a lot. She was um, actually expecting another baby. She was four months pregnant when this happened, which you know added to the tragedy. She wanted her mother to come and stay with them, even you know live with them in an attic upstairs room. And he didn't really get along very well with his mother-in-law, so there was some tension there about how often she should be staying with them and visiting. And then the, he was also having some affairs, so there. You know, Michelle didn't know about it, but it was not a perfect marriage, but there was no violence in the marriage or anything like that. They did argue a lot, but they were trying to work on, on that. They were actually consulting with Meredith, who was trying to help them sort through things, their conflicts. She was their mediator. So right. Meredith lived nearby, and she yeah. was pretty involved in her sister's life and, and fairly involved in the in the relationship between uh, Michelle and Jason as well. Yes, right. She had been living there for um, since Pat, around when Cassidy was born, which was, um, she was a little, about two and a half years old when this happened. So she moved to the Raleigh area right after she was born to help. She was their full-time nanny and actually stayed with them for, I think, about the first year until they put Cassidy into daycare. But um, And she was, yeah, she was over there a lot. Now, you know, I, I understand that they didn't actually get along growing up. That's what, you know, friends of Michelle had said based on police records, but that they were, you know, trying to have a, a you know, good relationship, you know, now that they were grown and, so actually, the house where uh, Meredith lived was about 10 minutes away from um, Michelle and Jason's house. And Linda Fisher, the, mo- the mother, um, Michelle and Meredith's mother, had bought that house with the plan to, to move to Raleigh in the future. So Meredith was living there for the time being while Linda still lived in New York. The night that Michelle was killed, Jason had left, I think, around maybe 7 o'clock that, that evening. Yeah. And she had a friend, I don't remember her friend's name, but she had a friend come over and they spent... Yeah. And who was that? Shelly Shad was her name. And talk a little bit about that that evening and what they were doing. So she had her her friend over. She was a sorority sister of Michelle's. They'd been friends for several years and they still kept in touch after college. Um, Shelly came over for the night because she had just gotten married and just got back from her honeymoon. So they were going to look at pictures and just catch up. Both of them decided to, that this was a good night for them to get together because both of their husbands were away on business. So she came over to the house just before Jason left and had brought food, and they um, were going to watch Grey's Anatomy and hang out. kind of interesting that evening because Shelley later told police that she felt like they were being watched. She said it was just the, you know, the house was very dark, the blinds were open, and she just felt weird that night. She she actually asked Michelle to walk her to her car when she left the home at about 10.30 that night. Shelly had some concerns. She was certainly quite uncomfortable with with being in that house and that she felt something wasn't right. Yes, yes. She felt uneasy that night for sure. So Jason was not in Raleigh at the time that Michelle was killed and the police, I believe, said that it was sometime, I think, between maybe midnight and 6 a.m. that they thought she was killed. That was the estimated time of death that they gave. It was a pretty big range. I really wish that, I think they could have narrowed it better if they would have um, looked at some things, you know, right when the body was found, There's like temperature, like things weren't checked that could have been. But anyhow, so yeah, it's midnight to six. Well, he checked into his hotel in Virginia at 11.50, I want to say. It was shortly before midnight. There's video or, you know, camera footage of him checking in at that time and he went to his room checked in called Michelle said I'm here so they you know they spoke so it must have been 10 to 11 not 10 to 12 I'm sorry one of the one of the yeah. things I've, I've noticed in, in many cases is it just it doesn't seem that either the forensic pathologists or the police or those involved they do not spend a lot of time trying to really pinpoint the time of death when it is so critical especially when someone such as in this case has a pretty strong alibi you know, for the police to, to not have a better timeline on when they think that she was killed when he's out of town is very, con- that immediately concerns me that they have a yeah. six hour window that, that they, that he could potentially be anywhere at that time. I didn't even think they took the body away until the next morning. So 
Yeah, a lot of things could have been done, which is unfortunate, but that does seem to happen a lot, like you said, where they don't do the things that are necessary to pinpoint time of death. Talk a little bit about the police and their initial investigation and why they zeroed in on Jason. Okay, um, before that, before just for listeners to, to understand, um, Cassidy was actually found in the house fine. She was clean and she was fine and safe, just so in case you were The two-year-old. Yes, yes, she was fine and um, not harmed in any way. In fact, she was clean. She had no blood on her. She was not wearing a diaper, which was odd because she wasn't fully potty trained yet. She was not wearing underwear. She just had on her pajama bottoms and a sweat, you know, her normal um, top that Michelle dressed her in the night before, which was an unusual and interesting aspect of the case, too. For the- that also became evidence for the the prosecution as far as the, thinking that it pointed towards Jason. Right, right, because they say who has cared enough to clean her. As far as how did the police investigation start, um, well, the Looking at the crime scene, that the, uh, there were bloody footprints found in the hall bathroom, and they were child size. Obviously, it was Cassidy. Now there was no trail though, so from the bedroom to that bathroom, so somebody obviously picked her up and, and either placed her there. Um, looking at the pictures, I personally think it looks like those footprints were staged because they all kind of move in the same direction and they aren't exiting that bathroom. So it looks almost like somebody, you know, did that for staging. Right. It doesn't appear that a child had been shut in that bathroom for a period of time and just kind of walking around randomly. It's in a very set area. It looks like the kid just kind of walked around in that one area, and then there's nothing else. Yes, exactly. And there were smears on the wall, too. So it was quite a bit of blood. You would have expected there to be a lot of blood on her, on her clothing, her pajamas. It was nothing. No, they did find um, in forensic testing later that there were trace signs of blood on the clothing, but you couldn't see it, it, you know, by eye. So it was almost as if they had been washed. And that was something that police wondered about, too. How did, how was it that, those, that she was so clean? Of course, Meredith could have cleaned her up, but they never really considered that. Jason had a receipt from the Cracker Barrel, which I believe was in Greensboro, they right. had him on video at the hotel in Virginia shortly before midnight. And they yeah. and so they know that he was at the hotel, which was approximately 170 miles from their house, around right. midnight. And they know that he was in the hotel room in the morning because he picked up the receipt that they'd slid under the door. Exactly. Right. And so, the newspaper. And the newspaper. I mean, which had the sticker of Hampton Inn. So they knew for sure that he definitely was there, you know, at, at midnight, and he definitely was there at what time he would have left. But there's no footage of him leaving at, you know, 7 that morning or whenever he left. Right, but I know the police went to great lengths to try to figure out if there was any way he could have gotten that receipt early or later yeah. so that he – to try to give him less of an alibi – but right. w- with those two factors, because he's alibied on the front and the end of their of their time frame for her death, mm-hmm. and he's 170 miles away, uh, it, basically you're looking at someone that would have had to have left almost immediately after he was seen on video, driven yeah. directly to the house and, and killed her, and then driven straight back, which yeah. means that for the most part she would have had to have been killed at about 3 a.m. based on yeah. that. And that he would have, right, uh, theoretically, and that he would have had no time to do anything that they're talking about at the house as far as maybe doing laundry or or anything with the child. Or staging, or, right. Because there was a jewelry box um, on the the corner of the dresser that was, two of the drawers were missing. So, you know, was that a theft? You know, did he stage that? That was their, that was their theory that he staged that and took those. Um, we should probably mention that she was actually found um, the way that she was killed with um, blunt force trauma to the head. She had several blows to the head, um, defensive wounds on her hands. Her teeth were knocked out. It was a very, very brutal murder. They don't know what the, the uh, murder weapon was. Uh, I go into the book that um, one of the investigators hired by the young family found, it was Marius Godwin, he found um, some pictures of in blood that looks pointed, it almost looks like an iron. So, you know, it's not clear what the murder weapon was, but she was 
really viciously beaten. Probably the fight started in the bed and she ended up, she was found on the floor. The closet door to, um, of Jason's closet was opened after the beating because you could see where the, the blood had been, that the door was shut at the time of it, but it was actually open when police found her. Or police didn't find her, Meredith did, but you know, when police arrived, they noticed that. But somebody got into that closet for a reason, too, which they actually say fits their theory that he went in there to change clothes. Okay. Yeah, for the police and the prosecutors, almost all the, any evidence they found seemed to line up with Jason as the suspect. Well, they tried to make it seem that way, yeah. Right. It, it, you know, just looking at this from the outside, as soon as you hear his alibi, you've got to be thinking that he, it's going to be pretty tough to bring him as a suspect just based on that How, yeah. because he's he's so far away. However, Jason's reaction to his wife being murdered is one of the primary things that got the police interested in him. Talk, You're right. Talk about what how Jason responded when he found out that his his wife had been murdered. Okay, well... He found out, he was, he made his uh, other sales calls. Linda Fisher, um, she found out from Meredith. She was hysterical, obviously. She called Jason's mother. Jason was en route after his sales trip. He was going to visit his mother in Brevard, North Carolina. So he was on his way there. He arrived at, I don't know, maybe 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock that afternoon and got the news about Michelle. And it was... You know, he broke down at the fall to his knees. It was just in shock. And anyhow, the family uh, got in the car to come to Raleigh. He had to get to um, his daughter and, you know, just get home, right? So as he was on his way home, he got a call from his one of his best friends. It was actually Shelly Shedd, who had been with, uh, with Michelle tonight. It was her husband called and said, hey, police are asking a lot of questions about you. They they think you're, you know, they're suspicious of you. You better not talk to them. Call a lawyer. I, I advise you not to talk to them tonight. So Jason decided when he got to Raleigh that he was not going to talk to police until he had a chance to talk to a lawyer, and, and he so he didn't. So they became immediately suspicious of him. You know, why isn't he helping? His, you know, what happened to his wife? We need to ask some questions. But, you know, everyone's always said, don't. You know, don't talk to police until you talk to a lawyer if you're being accused of something. So he, you know, abided by that. And when he finally did talk to a lawyer, the lawyer basically advised him, do not talk to police whatsoever. They can do their investigation. It's safest for you to just remain silent. And so he took that advice. And you're right, that that's what cast a lot of suspicion on him. So even though that was his, his constitutional right, he he had no obligation to talk to the police, that decision, which it's debatable whether it was the right decision, is what got the police com- completely fixated on Jason, that there must be something going on because he's not talking to us. Right. That combined with the fact that he was having an affair. They had found out that he was having an affair at the time and had a lot of communications with a, a woman who lived in Florida. He figured that you know, here it is. It's all. You know, normally it's a husband and a spousal murder. He's not talking to us, so he must be hiding something, and he's having an affair. So yeah, I can naturally see why they would have suspected him. However, once that saw that he had that alibi and that meant that the scene wasn't really fitting, plus some other witnesses, it wasn't fitting. But they still stayed on him. They still stayed locked on him. So with the al- with the alibi, and then we can. I want to get into some of the evidence at the scene. But yeah. with the alibi, they the police did everything they could to try to break his his alibi of being at the hotel. And one of the things they found was they found a woman who worked at a gas station in I believe it was in Virginia that that morning that Michelle was killed, and she became an eyewitness as far as saying that that Jason Young had purchased gas in the middle of the night, I think it was around 5 a.m., and that he had purchased $15 worth of gas. And so now they have uh, what they believe to be an eyewitness noting, you know, saying that Jason was out in the middle of the night driving back from Raleigh, and this this proves it. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so what happened was, um, actually it was in King, North Carolina, which is about 120 miles from Raleigh. Okay. 
and she said the police were, um, they said that they were backtracking from the hotel where he stayed and t- taking the route that he most likely would have taken to get back to Raleigh that night. And they were looking at gas stations that were open that night. And they went to the Four Brothers. It was kind of a BP station in Kane, North Carolina. And they talked to this woman named Gracie Bailey. And allegedly, now I don't, I don't necessarily trust police with the whole story because it just doesn't make sense with the way that they say it happened. So they supposedly showed her a picture of him and said, hey, did you see this guy? And she was like, oh, yeah, he came in. He was all swearing at me. He told me to turn the pumps on and got $15 worth of gas and left. Now, actually, the the police that officer that, that did this, he didn't write up a, a summary or any kind of a, a narrative until, you know, six months later. And all he had was these, like, little notes. He didn't even have any hand notes about it. He had these little 5 a.m. may have seen him something like that. It was just very brief. And then the police just kept looking at all these other gas stations to try to find them. Well, if they had this witness that saw him, then why did they keep looking? It just doesn't make sense. But she was also um, brain damaged and on disability. Um, she had a serious accident when she was a child. She couldn't even, at a you know, pre-trial hearing, she couldn't even identify him accurately. He said that he was short and balding, and he's not. He's tall and, you know, full head of hair. So, you know, it's a very iffy witness, but they they just stuck with her because they had such, they really had no case, and they so they went with it, you know, and had just a star witness. Yeah, she did not uh, come across as being a, a good witness at all, just based on yeah. a lot of the issues she had. And another factor here with with this, I mean, this was basically their evidence that he was out in the middle of the night that he killed Michelle. However, he purchased gas. He filled up his tank when he left Raleigh the night before. Yes. And so the hotel room was uh, the hotel was 170 miles from his house, and for him to have killed Michelle, he would have had to have driven 340 miles, driving to the hotel and coming back to kill her. And then, as you said, the the gas station was 120 miles further. Right. So that's that's 460 miles that he would have had to driven, which right. his car he had a, an SUV. I don't remember what kind exactly. It was an Explorer. Ford Explorer that mm-hmm. he would not have been able to get 460 miles on that tank. As a result, he would have had to purchase gas prior to that. And then the other right. factor is if he was if he was either almost out of gas would which would be the only reason for him to stop because if he's seen his alibi is blown why would he only purchase $15 worth of gas which gets him nowhere exactly and and also it just coincidentally this gas station didn't have cameras so you know they couldn't well he was there or not just how would he have known he's taken a big risk going into this gas station being seen um, and they were never able to find where he would have purchased this additional gas. Right. Um, and all of his gas mileage for his entire trip aligns perfectly with all of his receipts that he um, for Phillips along his whole journey. You know, the whole time that he was on this trip. So it, the gas thing is a huge problem for the state. But again, they still stayed with him. He purchased gas, I think, the following afternoon out in in Western uh, Virginia. Right. And like you said, all of the his the receipts that he had and all those purchases line up perfectly with the mileage that he would have driven. Right. And had he stopped and gotten gas at this Four Brothers gas station, he would have needed gas prior to when he stopped that following afternoon because of the distance he drove. Right. Fifteen dollars yeah. worth of gas was not enough. Right. He would have run out. And again, they looked at every gas station between there and his uh, first uh, customer stop, and th- there weren't any. You know, nobody identified that he stopped and got that extra gas that would have been needed to make their theory work. I feel like, I mean, I can understand how if if the maybe if a jury's not paying attention that they could get this detail past them. But as as investigators, as detectives, I mean, to me, what they're saying is, well, the details don't line up, but we've got him in the middle of the night, so that's the evidence. Where right. when you dig into it, the the details, it, it's not. It is. It's refutable. the The eyewitness no longer makes sense, and the eyewitness no longer substantiates their claims. Right. I know it's very frustrating. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I just I wanted these facts out there, 
and and you know his defense attorneys did a really good job showing this at trial, especially in the first trial with the gas. You know they showed exactly how the gas receipts lined up. Talk a little bit about the evidence at the crime scene. Okay, at the crime scene, um, they found um, two sets of footprints in blood on on some pillows. Um, there were pillows, oddly, all around Michelle's body. As I said, she was found face down. She was fully fully clothed. She had on like jogging pants and a hooded sweatshirt, which was kind of unusual because she wouldn't have slept in a hooded sweatshirt. So that makes you think that maybe she was already up in the morning getting ready to exercise or um, actually the treadmill was on too. It wasn't running, but it was uh, the switch was on and there was a bottle of water near there. So, you know, there's some speculation that she may have been exercising that morning. But anyhow, um, so two sets of footprints were found. One of them was clearly identified as a size 10. It was, it was a, I think it was called a Franklin Athletic shoe that's typically sold at like low end dollar stores. And then there was another one that they really couldn't identify for a long time. They finally sent it to the FBI and it came back as a hush puppy in a couple of different versions of a type of hush puppy. And they couldn't really pinpoint the size, but they guessed that they may be maybe an 11 or a 12. Now, Jason wore a size 12, I believe. So because the second print, they didn't have a full print, right? So they had to kind of estimate on what they thought the size was? Yeah, it wasn't a real real good print, and it was smudged and smeared, and yeah, so it was really kind of hard to tell the size. But they did actually find that in 2005, like a year and a half prior to the murder, he had purchased a pair of Hush Puppy shoes, and they said that that imprint, it was kind of a strange, like a little heart-shaped imprint that was found on the sole, the sole would have, of the shoe would have left. They think that, that his, the shoes that he purchased would have matched that. He didn't have those shoes because he said he had given them to Goodwill. I was going to ask you, so the, the prosecution was not able to present the bloody right. the shoes with the bloody sole at trial, were they? Exactly. No, they couldn't. They never found them, and he, he didn't know where they were either. But this is the thing that gets me about those shoes that they want to try to say, well, he was wearing those hush puppies that night. He must have been there with somebody that had a size 10. First of all, where's this conspirator? They never linked anybody to him that would have been involved in this crime. There was no payoff of money or anything like that. They never found this other supposed suspect. And so it definitely looked like two people were there. Okay, so we have to, the two different types, types of shoes. But the thing about the, the shoes is that there were a pair of slip-on casual shoes similar to that hush puppy style that were in the back of his Explorer. So clearly he was wearing, a, you know, that type of shoe on that trip. So why would he have had another, like, hush puppy shoe too, you know? You have a, a bloody footprint at the crime scene, right. which certainly is compelling, and it sounds like, boy, that, that could be very incriminating. Yet yeah. there are two things that completely just throw the evidence into question and make it worse for the prosecution. One is, like you said, there's two sets of footprints. So now right. you're looking at two killers, and we have no information, no evidence that there's anyone linked to Jason. So that's the first right. problem. Now you've got, uh, you've got two footprints. And then the second is that they're claiming that it, 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 it is tying to a shoe that they can't produce and they don't even – and even if they could, I mean, they, they'd need to be able to show at least that there's blood on there or something that would be consistent with the crime scene. So they're, right. you know, they're tying it to evidence that doesn't exist. And, and the fact that, that Jason was not able to produce this shoe, which would be a fun exercise for anyone to try to find every shoe that they've purchased, say, in the last two or three years, what they did with it. I mean, how do you – I mean, right. that's just absurd. And that somehow, yeah. like, the fact that he can't produce them means that he must have gotten rid of them because he was wearing them when he killed her. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's what they tried to say. I think Jason made a huge mistake not talking to the police. I can understand – wanting to have a lawyer present when you're being questioned, but he should have helped the police with the murder investigation of his wife and unborn child. However, legally, he didn't have to. And that decision is not evidence, though the police and prosecutors in this case certainly thought it was. You can listen to the Twisted Podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, or Libsyn. For more information on upcoming shows and other true crime info, please visit me at twistedpodcast.com. 
On the next episode, out, coming out in the middle of December, I will continue my interview with author Lynn Blanchard about her latest book, which can be found on Amazon using the search terms absence of evidence. Thank you for joining me today.